Amen. Amen. It's the only church. It's the only church I've ever been to in the month of June that the doors are open <laughs> and the air units aren't flowing. Where I'm from, it's about 104 right now. I like it here. I do. I'm serious. Uh, I don't know really what to say. Um, First of all, to uh, honor to Pastor Shear because she met her in Israel and she says, I have a church in Alaska. And I said, well, I've never preached there. And uh, I said, I'll come preach for you. I didn't ask her where she, where she, what town she was from. And when we were coming up, um, we, we were going to have a birthday cruise with 500 of our, well, 600 of our friends. And uh, Sunday, I think we leave, June 23rd is my birthday. And I'll be 30, praise the Lord, 30, plus, 30 plus. 30. No, I actually become 60, which doesn't even seem real, because I've been preaching for 42 years since I was, uh, yeah, since I was 16 years of age. And so it seems a little surreal to get to that mile marker, but uh, we're, we're going to be, you know, going out of Seattle, leaving tomorrow, meeting the family and, and some folks coming up. But I just want to say that about your pastor, and of course you may be visiting, but I speak to, of this gentleman on the front row here, this Devonier, Genesequa, man of God. Excuse me, my wife has been texting me of many, many cares uh, of life, so I'm going to have to cut her off. Sorry, honey. <laughs> she texts me right before I preach all the time, you know. Um, anyway, I, 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 I never, I have not met, and I want to say this sincerely, and then I'm going to preach, I promise. Um, some of the, some of the friendliest people we've ever met are, I have met here in this state, but your pastor is a, a, my brother from another mother for sure. I'm serious. Um, I, I don't know when I have met someone that has my DNA. I whistle in church. And he just whistled in church. I said, this is unbelievable. <laughs> I met a, I, you know why I do that? Because if I yell too much, I don't want to lose my voice. So I, I, and I, brother, I can whistle. I can, I can move some birds off the roof whistling. I'm telling you for sure. But I went by the building that this church is building. And it is absolutely remarkable. And I want to say this. I've been to the, I've been, let, the lower 48th, as they say here. I've been to some of the greatest churches in America, and I mean churches that hold eight to 10,000 people and churches that just are wonderful. And I have never seen a view from a front of a church that that church is going to have. I mean, that is like crazy, man. Crazy, crazy. Normally we have product with it, but it all sold out at the, at the previous location, and I apologize for that. I do want to mention to you, and I'm not, I'm not sales pitching here. I don't do that. But we finished our Old Testament commentary. I don't know if you know that. It's not on Manifest yet. It doesn't come on Manifest till July 19th. But if you have my office number, you can call my office at Voice of Evangelism in Cleveland. And that Old Testament is that thick. I have never, and I have never had more comments in 42 years of preaching from people who have said the first 50 pages I learned more than I learned in my whole life in Sunday school. And so we're glad for that. And so I just want to let you know that if, you, if you're looking for anything, we weren't not able to bring that. And my wife, of course, wants to greet any partners. Do I have any partners here tonight of our ministry that are from a Stand up. Come on, we'll look at you. Hallelujah. Good to see you. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That, that means a lot. And I just want to say that, that, that God is moving in this state. I know revival. I've done it all my life. And there is something that's happening, and it's very important. Do not, this is a word for you, do not miss the time of your visitation. Israel had, Israel had a time that the Lord came to them, and he said, you're about to miss the time of your visitation. So when the Spirit of God begins to do these things, there's two things I need to tell you. You stay in unity, and you stay in love with each other. Because listen to a preacher who's been preaching 42 years. Satan 
demons and devils can do absolutely nothing to a group of people who are in love and in unity. If you stay, if you stay in love and unity, that's the power twins of warfare. And one, as long as you love, you know, you, if, you're, if you're in a good marriage, you can have a fuss, but you don't divorce because you have a fuss. And church people will get in a fuss and separate from each other. But that's because you haven't perfected the love of the Lord. Oh, why am I preaching that? I don't know. Okay, I got to get started. I have to get started. I have to get started. And, and I want you to go with me, and I'm going to have to get this the Bible out here, and we're going to read Matthew chapter 20. If you have a Bible, I hope you do. Get your iPad out, your phone out. You know, we have to say that now. Everybody's got their Bible on electronic means. I do, I do use, because it's what I started quoting at age 16, the King James translation of the Bible is 1611. So if you have that translation, you will follow me. And if not, you have another translation, it will be very similar. I'm certain to what I'm about to read. Luke, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1. And uh, this is what the Word of the Lord says. Have you found it? Okay. It's in the Bible, I can promise you. Okay, we're ready since you have it now. Been waiting on you. You ready? For the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning into hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, that's a denarius, a day's wages, he sent them into his vineyard, and he went out about the third hour. Somebody say third hour. And saw others standing idle in the marketplace, said to them, Go ye into the vineyard, whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way, and again he went out the sixth and ninth hour. Say sixth hour. Six say ninth hour. Nine hour. It's important in a moment. And they did likewise. About the eleventh hour. Now this is getting late. Somebody say eleventh hour. He went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? And they said, Because no man has hired us. He said, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. Now remember this. The eleventh hour is one hour on the Jewish calendar before sunset. They are going to work one hour. <laughs> when even was come, that sunset, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto the steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire. Now watch this. Beginning from the last to the first. Now, this is strange. Not from the first. The normal thing to do is pay the guys that's just worked nine hours and bore the heat of the day. You want to honor them. No, he doesn't do that. He takes the one-hour workers and brings them to the desk and gives them the money first. Then he goes down the line, and the very ones that work the longest, he waits and puts them in last. Mm, and they that were hired about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. Same wage. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house, saying, these last, meaning the last group you hired, have wrought but one hour, and you've made them equal with us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. And he answered one of them and said, friend, I did you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a penny? Take what's yours and go your way. I will give unto this last even as... Now, here's the verse. I will give unto this last even as I gave unto the first. Are you going to hear it in a minute? Is it law for me to do what is, what is good with my own? Is your eye evil because I'm good? So the last shall be first. And... The first shall be last, and many be called, but few chosen. I had a Greek scholar tell me one time that you could say it this way. Many are called, few choose. Why do you think Jesus said, let no man take your crown? Because you had an assignment you didn't do. And he raised up someone else to take your place to do it. You will not be rewarded for what you did not do. You will only be re rewarded for the assignment that you were given that you fulfilled. For me to look at this verse of the first will be last. 
and the last shall be first, I go to something which is called the law of the second. There is a very strange principle in the scripture, and I'm going to give you some examples very quickly, of the law of the second, where in the scripture, the firstborn son was to get the blessing and the birthright. And it means double inheritance. When the father died, everything that the firstborn got was double of what every other person in the family received. But there's this crazy thing that begins to happen in the Bible where Esau is first and Jacob is second and yet second overtakes the first. There's a strange verse in the Bible where Manasseh is the firstborn of Joseph and then Ephraim. But suddenly in the Bible when the hands are crossed by the man of God, we discover that the second who is Ephraim is exalted into the position of the first. We see, for example, with Adam, we have the first man Adam and what's called the second man Adam, who is Christ. And the second man Adam uh, undid the, the demonic attack that was brought on by the first man Adam. So the second, whoo, I'm about to go somewhere. The second is blessed above the first. And then we have another principle where we see that in the Bible for 4,000 years, the Jewish people were under the covenant, the law and Moses. Let's say from the creation of Adam, the Jewish people did not exist till Abraham. But we can go into that time and see from Abraham all the way to the time of, of Christ that there's this, this first covenant. But all of a sudden, Christ introduces a new covenant established on promises. And it tells us that the second is better than the first. Where are you going? I'm going to show you if you'll just keep listening. And then we read this in the Bible. We read this. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once more, literally in a little while, I'll shake the heaven and the earth and the seas and the dry land, and I will shake all nations that they may come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with my glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And here's the verse I want you to hear. For the glory of the latter temple, that's the second one, will be greater than the glory of the former temple. Now, we, you want to get serious about this. The first temple is built by Solomon, was a multi-billion dollar temple by today's standards. And yet God says... You may have seen a cloud in the temple of Solomon and you may have experienced the glory, but there will be a greater glory coming to the second. The second is the one called Herod's temple. It was the one, it's the Jews call it the second temple. Why was the glory? I never read where the cloud of God came down. I never read where there was an Ark of the Covenant. In fact, the Ark was missing in the temple in Jesus' day. So how can the second temple have greater glory than the first temple? The answer is Jesus Christ stood and ministered in that temple and he is the manifest glory of the Father. Hmm. Now, I want you to keep in mind the law of the second because I'm going to be talking about the law of the 11th in just a moment. And I don't want to take you there without giving you a pretty amazing biblical lesson. Would you step with me now in my ISO International School of the Word Bible School and let me teach you a little bit about some Jewish history. How many like to go into some real good history here? Well, now let's go back to the time of creation in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. It's very interesting that the Bible tells us that when God made, made certain things on each day, he says it this way, that the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, this does not make sense because a day in Hebrew is the Hebrew word yom, like yom kippur, day of atonement. And it actually refers to a 24-hour period of time. So how can God say that the evening, which is sunset, to the morning is the first day? Because, as I will show you in a moment, that is only 12 hours. And it was Jesus who said, are there not 12 hours in a day? So what God is doing by talking about the evening and the morning is back 
backwards from the way that we live because we would say the morning at sunrise is when we get up and at sunset is when we go to bed. So this should read this way. The morning and the evening was the first day. But you know God does his best work in the darkness. God does his best work when there is no light. Because you walk by faith and not by sight. Now, having, having said that, I want to show you something about this time of creation. We today, we have names for the day. Today is Friday. Tomorrow is Saturday. Then we have Sunday. Now, where did these names originate? They did not originate with the Jewish people, nor did they originate in the Bible. They originated with the Greeks and Romans. Because what the Greeks and Romans did is the Greeks and Romans would take the planets... Or the gods, and they would name the days after that. Like, for example, Saturday is Saturn's day. Sunday is the sun's day. Monday is the moon's day. Now, just because they use the planets to name the days, we don't do away. I ain't going to talk about Sunday because they say it's Sundays. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. We still use those days. So we identify the seven days of the week. And we begin, our, we begin our week on Monday, and then we go all the way through Sunday. In the old time, the seventh day was Shabbat, which was a Saturday. That's true. But follow me carefully, because God says, and the evening and the morning of the first day, then the second day, and the third day, and the fourth day, and the fifth day, and the sixth day. And finally, he makes man on the sixth day, and then it says, and God rested on the seventh day. Now, you need to understand something about God. He that keepeth Israel shall never sleep nor slumber, according to the psalmist. So why is God needing to rest on the seventh day? The answer is, there's nothing else to make what are you going to make there's nothing else to make because everything on the earth the things that are there the metal came from iron in the earth oh, you don't want me to preach this the rubber came from the trees see God put everything in here that everything we would have would come from so he did nothing else to make so when God rested on the seventh day the Bible tells us that God didn't rest on the seventh day for him he did it for us to show us that we were to work six days and then we were to have a day which is called Shabbat which is a time of rest I'm, I haven't started preaching yet just stay with me if you will please <laughs> now in the in the historical setting of things the days were once divided up as I said 24 hours but this is the way they were divided up in the Roman time the Romans had four watches and they did it are you are you ready for this they, mm -hmm, they did it from evening till morning. Their watches were from six. Here we go. First watch was from six, uh, six in the evening till nine o'clock at night. That's called even in your Bible. Even, E-V-E-N. The second watch is from nine till 12 midnight, and that is called midnight in your Bible. Then we find the third watch is from 12 till three in the morning, and that was called the cock crowing. And then we find the fourth watch is from three to six in the morning, and that's called morning. Now, here's your verse that identifies the four time frames. Mark chapter 13, 35 through 37. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight. He's given the order, even or midnight or at cock crowing or in the morning. What he did, he just gave the four watches that the Romans had and how they divided the night time up. Now, I just want to preach for just a minute and tell you that Jesus is up praying according to your Bible in the Gospels at the fourth watch. The fourth watch is from 3 o'clock till 6 o'clock in the morning. Now, it says in your Bible as he is on a high mountain praying and suddenly he sees, he notices, he perceives, he discerns that his disciples are in trouble. I have been to Jerusalem 36 times, Tiberius 36 times, and I can tell you that at certain times of the year, at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's not Alaska. You have no sun at 3, you have no sun at 4, you have no sun at 5, and then it, depending on the time of the year, 5.30ish, sun begins to break across, 6 o'clock, sunrise begins, seen it many times. But here's the part that's interesting. If you've been to Galilee, there's a high mountain. You can't see those fishing boats that are in the midst or in the middle of the lake. It's impossible. So I will ask you a question. How could Jesus, at the fourth watch, beginning at 3 o'clock in the morning when there is no light out, see a boat that was having 
and difficulty. And the answer is the Greek word there, when it says he perceived they were in trouble, that's what it means. It means he had a perception. He did not literally see it with his eyes, but something in his spirit quickened him, and he had a perception there's trouble in the middle of the lake. Now, here's lesson number two. I'm sidetracking on a rabbit trail to teach you something. Lesson number two is this. It says that as they're rowing and the wind is contrary, suddenly he appears in the middle of the lake. Now, how do you get from that high mountain where he's praying? Because you got to walk off that mountain. you got to go to the edge of the lake. And if they're in the middle of the sea, that sea used to be seven miles wide, which means not only is he walking off the mountain, but he's got to walk three and a half miles. But the Bible says that the moment he perceives that they are in trouble, he is in the middle of their storm. Mm, my God, that should tell you something. I, I, would, I, I hope somebody gets a little bit of hope right now because it tells me that when Jesus perceives that you're in trouble, it don't take him hours to get to your situation. Even if you're in the middle of a lake, in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the waves, and in the middle of the wind. And then the Bible says in one instance that when he calms everything down, it says in your Bible, and immediately they were on the other side. Now, they're in the middle of the lake. How do you get off of a mountain and get in the middle of a lake in a split second time just because you perceive the trouble? But the biggest thing is how do you pick up a boat with 12 men rowing in it and get it to the other side of a lake the moment that you calm a storm? Which goes to share me lesson number one is Jesus can perceive your danger. Lesson number two is he can get to your situation without taking a lot of time. And number three is he can get you out of your mess faster than you can blink. By the time you blink your eyes and the waves have laid down, you look up and you're already on shore and you don't even know how you got yourself there. Has anybody ever had God show up and all of a sudden he'd come through so quick, you start saying to yourself, how in the world did that happen? My God, I've been praying a long time, but all of a sudden God, how in the world did that happen? If he can take a man of God all the way from, well... From blessing a little Ethiopian eunuch, a little black man from Africa, and preaching the gospel to that man, and transport a man all the way back to the city of Samaria that would take you hours even driving there. If the Lord can do it that quick, that quick, he can transport a boat and pick it up and move it all the way to the other side of the lake. I've come by to tell some, that's not my message, but I feel like somebody needs to hear it. The mess that you got yourself in and the mess that you found yourself in, you're trying to figure out how to get out. Why don't you get Jesus in the middle of your storm? And and then when you get Jesus in the middle of your storm, he'll figure out how to pick you up and get you out of the, hey, the mess that you got yourself in. Woo. Now back to the message. Romans had four watches that began evening to morning. Jews, on the other hand, had, had, had three watches instead of four. Now, that's where the word watch came from because when you have a watch, it tells you the time it is. So a watch was geared around time, certain hours, certain time frames. There is the beginning of the watch. This is mentioned in Lamentations 2 and 9, which is sunset till 10 p.m. Uh, I haven't got to my message yet, but I'm about to get there, so you stay with me. In the, the middle watch... It's mentioned in Judges chapter 7 and verse 19. It's 10 p.m. to 2 in the morning. The morning watch is mentioned in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 24. And it's 2 a.m. till sunrise. And if you're writing those references down, you can go later, especially the one in Exodus and Judges is very interesting. And you can see that. Now, Jesus divides. Uh, I think I'll give you a nugget here. Jesus divides the day up and he makes this statement. And this statement is found in John eleven nine. 9. Are there not 12 hours in a day? Now what he's saying is 12 hours, 12 hours in a working day. They did not work eight hours in the time of the Lord. That's a more contemporary type of work. They worked from the moment the sun came up, which averaged at 6 o'clock. And they're up and dressed and, you know, getting their plows or getting their animals ready. And as the sun is setting at 6 o'clock, and this is an average, then they worked for 12 full hours. There was no television. There was no Internet. There was no Facebook. There was no Twitter, Twitter, <laughs> Gitter. You know, there was none of that. And so because there's none of that, they would, they would simply go to bed and they, would, they worked hard and they could sleep long. But because they went to bed early, they got up early. Does this make sense to anybody? Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. You have to be an old timer. Like I'm as old as Benjamin Franklin now, so you have to be an old timer to understand that. Now, 
when you understand how the Jews count the days, then something will make sense to you, and that is the crucifixion of Jesus. As the Son of Man, Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man must be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. Now, maybe you've never heard me teach this. I only taught it once on Manifest. I want you to go to the book of Jonah sometime. I'm on another rabbit trail. Excuse me, I'll get to, the, I'll, 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 I'll get to 3, 6, 9, 11 in just a minute, but we're on a rabbit trail. But I want you to go to the book of Jonah sometime, and I want you to read what really happened to Jonah because we have always been taught that he... They threw him off the boat. A fish swallowed him, and he stayed alive in that fish's belly for three days. He did not. He died in that fish's belly. That fish was sent to preserve his body from being eaten by the sharks and the other animals that would have been in the Mediterranean Sea. How do I know that? Because he said, out of the belly of hell I cried. He says, he says, when my soul fainted within me, I cried to the Lord. My head went down and the seaweeds were wrapped around my neck and the iron bars of hell. Well, you better hear me. Jonah died and drowned. A fish came and swallowed him and preserved his body in that fish's belly for three days. And, and if you'll go, I want you to read it. I want you to go read it and I want you to go look at it. He is praying not in the belly of the fish. He is praying out of the fish's belly. And he said, when he was fainting, when I, my soul fainted, I remembered the Lord. And he was preserved for three days as Jesus body was wrapped up and laid in a tomb and preserved for three days. That's why he said as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the fish, so the son of man must be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. Are you listening, somebody? But if you want to know about the, the three days and nights of the crucifixion, this is what you have to remember. We want to count 24 hours. The Jews don't do that. He was crucified at 3 o'clock. He's beginning to cry. It is finished. At 6 o'clock, he's in the ground. That's only three hours. That's a whole day to the Jews. Because any part of an hour, I'm, I'm going to prove it to you from this parable, any part of an hour is considered a part of the day. So in three, from, from 3 to 6, he's already, he's already gone, according to them, according to the time. Oh, I see. I shouldn't have got on this. I got you all confused. And you're, looking like, you're, looking like a, you're looking like a cow trying to figure out to go into a gate. I don't know if I should go in that gate. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off of that. I'm going to get off of that, and I'm going to go back over here to the time frame because that's what my message is about. Touch a neighbor, say neighbor. Yeah. Time frames. I want to tell you when these men were hired in the parable where men are standing by idle and suddenly they are hired by the goodman who has a vineyard. And if you know anything about the vineyards, you know, both in Old Testament, a vineyard represents Israel. You will know from the New Testament that uh, Jesus is, says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And all of this is metaphors for the people of God. It's metaphors for the kingdom of God. It's metaphors for the church. Uh, the vineyard can represent all of these things. So notice what's happening. There is a necessity that sunset will come, in a, it come soon. And in order to get the harvest in, there must be a hiring of a certain number of men. And as this man begins to hire people to work as laborers, he suddenly realizes there's not enough laborers. Did not Jesus say to pray to the Lord of the harvest because there's not enough laborers in the field? Pray that there'll be more people out there helping to get this harvest in. So keep that in mind when we dig into this parable. But here's what I want to show you. The third hour of the day, these men were hired at nine o'clock in the morning because the third hour of the day is nine o'clock in the morning on the old Jewish Reckoning. Now, these men, if they work till evening, which is sunset. Oh, now I know where I'm going here. See, so you don't. I like it like that. <laughs> they worked for nine hours. Now, now in the Middle East, it's from 11 o'clock till 2.30 in the afternoon it, when the hottest part of the heat is. And they are perspiring and they are just sweating and they're dripping and they're stinking. They forgot to put their deodorant on when they went to the field that day. And they're just working themselves silly because they're about to get an entire day's wages as they were promised. So they're happy to work because they're going to get paid for what they do. And the man said, I don't have enough people. So at the sixth hour of the day, which is 12 in the afternoon, he goes out and he begins to hire another group. But guess what? They work three hours less than the first group. They only have to work six hours a day. But guess what? They're going to get paid the same amount as 
the nine hour working guys. So then he looks and he says, you know, we're not going to get this done by sunset if I don't get some more help. So he goes out and the Bible says at the ninth hour of the day, the ninth hour is three in the afternoon. He sees a group and says, hey, y'all want to, you all want to get paid a whole day's wages just working for three hours? Oh, we'd love that. So they jump in there. So here goes the nine hour guys looking, trying to figure out where these guys are coming from. And then here comes the other guys that got hired at 12 noon. And they said, well, at least we got some help to get it done. They're, watch this. They're not thinking about their reward. They're just thinking about quitting time. See, I've got 50 workers. I have some like Rob and Tammy, I don't mind telling you, who work their self silly. And I got others that if I was dying with a heart attack at five o'clock, they'd still go in the car and leave. I'm telling you the truth. Should have let them go a long time ago. Hope they hear this when I get back home. That's hardcore, but it's true. Are y'all still here? Oh. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, the man realizes sunset's going to be here before long. I got to get some more boys out here in the field. He go, now, watch this. This is where we're getting thick. So he goes at the 11th hour. Now, folks, this is 5 o'clock. He's going to put them in the vineyards, and all they have to do to get paid the same amount of the nine hour guys is work for one hour. Then payday comes and the nine hour men who are hired first are angry at the 11th hour men who are hired last. But then comes mm, the prophetic revelation of Jesus. There will come a time when the last generation stay with me will be first and all the first will come in last and it makes no sense till you understand what I'm about to tell you in the next five minutes I looked at these time frames and when I read the Bible I read the Bible maybe different than most people because I read the Bible and ask myself questions. The rabbinical way of studying scripture is to ask yourself questions on everything you read. A rabbi who teaches his students will read a verse and pose questions and have them either research the answer or answer it and then correct them if they're wrong and encourage them if they are correct. I said to myself, self That's what David said. David said, I will say to my soul, soul. So I said to myself, self. I just wonder if these time frames are anywhere else in the New Testament. I just wonder if somewhere in the Bible, the third hour is mentioned, maybe the sixth hour is mentioned, and just maybe the ninth hour is mentioned, and maybe the eleventh hour is mentioned. And if they are mentioned because you lay line on line, you lay precept on precept, Isaiah said, to form your teaching. Maybe the Lord in the parable is concealing a mystery for our time that will help me to. So let me just talk to you about the order of these hours and where they are also found in the Bible. Well, the third hour of the day is found in the book of Acts. For it happens to be the time when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. At nine o'clock in the morning or the third hour of the day, this is that spoken of by the prophet Joel. And God begins to pour out the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues to a whole group of people and amazes the crowd. You have people mocking, you have people doubting, but you have this move of the Spirit. Then I go and I say, where is the sixth hour? I discover in John's gospel that there is a woman sitting at a well. And the woman at that well is debating on where the right place is to worship. You know, sinners crack me up. Because this woman was not in covenant. She was not born again. And she'd have five different men that, that were her husbands. Jesus said they had been her husbands. Now what that means is that she had 
either, either been with those men sexually, five different men, and made covenant with them, or she had one and got rid of him and got a second one and got rid of him. I'm, I'm telling you the word, whether you believe it or not. Had a third one and got rid of him. Had a fourth one, got rid of him. Had a fifth one, got rid of him. And saw a tall, suntan Nazarene and thought she found number six. <laughs> this, she, this, old, this tall, handsome man from Galilee, when she found out she was a Jew, she marked him off the list. Let me talk to you for a minute. Let me tell you what the revelation Jesus is giving her. See, sinners are odd because many sinners know enough theology just to be dangerous. They know just enough scripture just to be dangerous. You find them in a bar and they'll say, well, didn't Jesus turn the water into wine? You'll find them smoking pot and they'll say, every green herb in the book of Genesis God has given for food. I got a friend of mine who was smoking pot one time and he said, you know, the Bible says every green herb God has given for food. I said, good, I got poison ivy, poison oak on a tree in my backyard. I want you to go dry it, roll it and smoke it and tell me what it's like. Every green herb, my foot. Shekatahasahata. Hey! But I want to show you where Jesus is. Jesus is sitting at a well. And if you know anything about Middle Eastern wells, they did not keep those wells open because of animals that would crawl in them and you would corrupt a fresh water well with a dead animal. But they had stone or big pieces of wood and they would cover the mouth of that well when they were not drawing water. So that woman had to open up the top of that well in order to get to the water that she was drawing. Now you understand that Jesus is telling her about worship and God in spirit and in truth. Let me talk to you for a moment. You ready? I want you to put your hands right below your diaphragm. Now, your diaphragm is where your rib cage meets. But I want you to go four fingers down, and I want you to press. Now, you're, I'm standing up. It's a little different because I'm preaching from my diaphragm. But you're sitting down. Now, I want you to say a praise. Just say it. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. God's good. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Isn't it interesting that you feel a little bit of movement when you say something? But watch when you start singing. Sing it. Hallelujah. Did you all feel a pressure come? You know, that's your diaphragm moving. And you see, people can sit in church and go through the phrases and the motions and not have it in their spirit. And they keep their well shut by going through a ritual. But when you begin to sing your praise and begin to worship in your praise, you take the cap off of that well, you open up the diaphragm of your spirit, so out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Hey! And the Lord is giving a woman a revelation of worship. And what time is he doing it? He's doing it at the sixth hour, which is 12. And then I found, yes, I did. Yes, I did. I found the ninth hour for it tells us that Peter and John hey, went into the temple to pray at the ninth hour. And the ninth hour happens to be, as you well now know, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. But let me talk to you about what happened as, as they hit the ninth hour. There was a man who has been laying at the eastern gate and the Bible said he's laid there every single day and he's rattling his little cup saying alms for the poor, alms for the poor and he's in a good location to get some alms because they're headed into the east gate which leads you into the area of the 10 trumpets or 12 trumpets which are little containers shaped like trumpets. They're narrow at the top, wide at the bottom and that's where you leave your offering. And so Peter did like this and he kind of jingled his pockets. He said, I, John, I was at that Perry Stone meeting in Alaska. I ain't got no money left. I gave it. They, had, they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. And when a guy was begging alms, he got legs instead. <laughs> Healing manifested at the third hour. And then, I, and, then I, and then I found something. I found something strange. I started looking for the 11th hour and it wasn't there. I 
I need to just drag you around with me to all my meetings and inspire me to preach. Now, why is it that the 11th hour is not found in all the different hours? It's because the 11th hour is a particular time frame that only happens once in history. So there will be no pattern for the 11th. There is a pattern. You better stay with me now. There is a pattern for the 3rd, the 6th, and the ninth. So let me take you to the United States of America, which has been the leading Gentile nation in the earth, which has been the leading nation for over 100 years to proclaim the gospel, to preach the gospel, to support the gospel, to send out the missionaries. Do you realize all but one Christian network started in America? And even the ones that are in foreign countries like Iran, the Farsi network and others, they were started by people who supported them from the United States. We are and have been the leading promoter of the gospel, pr printing Bibles, supporting orphanages. So let us see, is there a pattern that develops in this forest? Let us first go to the third hour. The third hour is the outpouring of the Spirit. This takes me to 1906. Actually, it started in 19, uh, uh, 1898 outside of Murphy, North Carolina with a group of Baptist preachers who got hungry for God. You may have never heard this story. And the Spirit of God came, get this, on 120 people. They were in a church and the power of God hit them in a little old church and the Spirit of God moved and persecution hit in in Murphy, North Carolina, and up into that Coker Creek area, and they moved to a little town called Cleveland, Tennessee. And when they went to Cleveland, Tennessee, I've got to tell you a funny story. This is absolute true. When they went to Cleveland, Tennessee, it was a town with about four to 5,000 people, and all of a sudden, all of them start turning into Pentecostals. They had a Bible school there called Bob Jones University, which was a very strict Baptist Bible, a good Bible school, by the way, but they did not believe in speaking in tongues. And Bob Jones said, this place is getting crazy. Did you know Billy Graham went to school one year in Cleveland, Tennessee at Bob Jones Bible School? Right in my hometown. That's right. And so, so they said, this is getting crazy. So he moved Bob Jones to uh, South Carolina where it's this huge university now. And Bob Jones, uh, the Baptist school was bought out by Lee, Brother Lee, and became Lee University, which, Lee College, which is now Lee University, which is a 4,000 member uh, Pentecostal charismatic Bible school. Cool. But let me go back to what I'm about to tell you. Then in 1906, there was the Azusa Street outpouring. And then there was another one in 1900 earlier in, in Topeka, Kansas. All of a sudden, from the East Coast, the Midwest, and the West, there are these outpourings of the Spirit. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is the third hour of the day. Because in that third hour of the day, there were 16 nations represented that said, what meaneth this? And when this outpouring came at the turn of the century, they mocked people people. They said, this is not of God. Others said, it must be of God. Others were amazed when they would hear these uneducated people speaking in Chinese and speaking in Japanese and speaking in Spanish. And they never studied those languages. I could tell you hair raising stories from those mountains on the east coast of the United States. But let me tell you something. Now, that was just the first initial move. That's the third hour move. But then from 1906 to about 19 1948, out of that move, we come to what I call the sixth hour manifestation. And the sixth hour manifestation was how to worship God, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And there were eight full gospel denominations. They all believed in the Holy Spirit. They all believed in the nine gifts of the Spirit. I'll just name a few of them for you. The Assemblies of God. Now, these are all birthed. These are eight that are birthed in this time frame. The Church of God out of Cleveland, Tennessee. The Assemblies of God. The Church of God of Prophecy. The Church of God in Christ. The great black organization that came out through the Church of God. You have the United Pentecostals. The UPC Pentecostals. You have the Apostolic Pentecostals. You have the Pentecostal Wholeness Church. You have the, oh, y'all, listen to me. You have the Four Square Gospel. All of these denominations were worshipped denominations. If you would have gone into their churches when they were organized, they were shouting, they were singing, they had camp meetings, they were putting tents up, people were falling under the power, people were being healed, they were mocked, they were ridiculed, they were criticized, but yet today, Day. They are the largest congregations in the entire world. So, there's a church in Indonesia that has 150,000 members. 
That's just one that we could name. So I'm telling you, this is the third hour visit. You say, tell me, about, I'm getting there. You've got to listen. You've got to build it. You've got to build this up. Then you come to 1948 and you come to the ninth hour. Because what happened at the ninth hour? I told you there was a miracle. A man that couldn't walk got up. And all through the book of Acts, you see healings and miracles take place. So from 1948 was the great healing revival. I know if you're old enough, you've studied it. I know you know about Oral Roberts, T.L. Osborne, T.L. Lowry, Morris Sorella, R.W. Shambach. My dad came out of that healing revival years ago. Thea Jones, men you would hear or heard of, men you've not heard of. T.L. Lowry, Morris Sorella. These men were young men, and they all start preaching at the same time, right about the time Israel became a nation. And for seven straight years, there were miracles that would blow your mind. Does anybody want to hear one? want to build your faith before I talk about this last generation. But my, when I was 18 years of age, God allowed me to meet the man who was Oral Roberts' first organ player right when he started putting up his tents. He remembers Oral when he started out. He traveled with him for a couple years. His name was Leonard Davis. His entire family could sing. I go to Bluefield, West Virginia to preach up in the mountains at a little rural church, and they came to hear me preach. Actually, he had two daughters that weren't married. I think he was interested in marriage. Are you listening to me? Didn't work out by the way just want you to know there was no dating of any kind that took place but 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 he was a kind man him and his wife very godly people and I said brother Davis you said you worked with Oral Roberts what's the greatest miracle you ever saw and he said to me he said I don't have to think twice about that he said we put the tent up in the Ohio Valley there's 10,000 people there that night Oral was praying for people he would have a card and you would fill out a card to keep order and you had there was like you everybody from A to Z um, I'm sorry, A to C might be called that night. So there was a lady that came and she's carrying this little girl that looks like she's five years old or so. And if he said, if I recall, she's about five. And says she's carrying this little girl and she's holding this little girl. And she stands up over here and she comes to the line. It's her time. And she, Brother Roberts, he notices that the little girl, her leg is like this. He said, bring her a chair where the little girl can stand up. And the girl stands up on a good leg. And this leg is just like this, just, just up and just dangling. And, uh, the, uh, Brother Robert said to the mother, what do you need God to do? She said, well, my girl was born without bones from her knee down. She has no bones. So Brother Roberts reached down. The little girl's holding on to her mama and took her foot and rolled it like a pretzel back against this right here and squeezed it. And it was like jelly. There was not a bone. There wasn't toe bone, ankle bone, heel bone, no bone. Brother Roberts then put the microphone away from him like this and said, Mom, listen to me. If your daughter had a cancerous bone, a broken bone, I could pray. But he said, I don't have no faith for this. He said, I'm, I'll be honest. And she screamed, Oh, Roberts, what kind of God do you serve anyway? She said, you just preached a message. He's the God of the impossible. She said, I didn't ask you to heal my daughter. I asked you to pray for God to heal my daughter. God's going... God's going to heal my daughter. He said, he said, okay, all right, I'll do the praying. You do the believing. So he put the microphone. He said, no, folks, this girl doesn't have a bone. And Brother Davis said, I'm standing right beside him, right beside him. I see it. And said, he said, I want us all to bow our heads and just go to God. This has to be a creative miracle, not a healing. Brother Roberts puts his hands on the little girl. The mother starts crying. Brother Davis said, I'm standing there. There's a roar in that tent. Compassion has hit people. But he said, Brother Roberts prays this very passionate prayer. Oh, great God in heaven, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This takes a creative miracle. God, this mother has faith to believe tonight. And while he's praying, Leonard said, I heard bones popping. And he said, when Brother Roberts said, close your eyes, it meant everybody on the platform. And you'd get it after church if you found out you weren't listening. But he said, I opened up one eye and looked, and that little girl is looking at that leg and looking at her mama, and that leg is going down, 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 and suddenly it's touching the chair. She, he said, all of a sudden, I see that little girl start bending that knee, and I hear pop, pop, pop. It sounded like chicken bone, chicken leg. Chick, take a chicken leg and break it. Pop, pop, pop. And he said, all of a sudden, that girl's looking at that leg, and she says, Mommy, 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 look. And he says, Honey, he's praying, he's praying. No, Mommy, you got to look. And when Mama looked, she looked down at the girl, and the girl's pointing to her leg, her leg, and she's standing on it. And the mother screams, and Brother Roberts jerks his hand back and looks at the leg. He says, Can you stand on that? And she's tiptoeing. He said, Oh, my God. And he looked at Leonard and said, That's one I can't even believe. And he said, Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
He said, put her down. And she walked with two perfect legs. He said, it's the greatest miracle I ever saw. God grew bones where there were no bones. Is anybody hearing what God is able to do? Are you listening, somebody? This was the ninth hour removed. Now, some suggest that this suggest that there's a slowing down of this outpouring. Some suggest the church has come through this season of emotional worship. Some suggest that the healing revival has passed, but I would like to take one note. And not only prove it otherwise, but show you what, why there is only one reference to the 11th hour. Please note, please note that the first hour was Pentecost and the second hour was worship. But the second hour people, even though they had worship, still were having outpourings of the Holy Spirit the entire time. You tracking? But then came the healing revival. And even though the miracles began to wane, if you'll look at history, God never quit healing just because the healing revival waned. So the ninth hour people were able to still tap into worshiping and they were still able to tap in outpourings of the Holy Spirit, even though it was not as major as Azusa Street, it was still happening. Lord have mercy. But there is an 11th hour people. And you've got to get the revelation. And if you can get it the way God gave it to me, you're going to do more than sit and just look at the preacher. Because watch this. That bunch that came in last. Because Jesus said, work while it's day for the night cometh when no man can work. And you know not when the trump of God shall sound, whether it be the morning or the cock crowing or the evening. But in your Bible and in your parables, when six o'clock comes, it's the end. I'm going to say it again. Forget time. Forget six o'clock, our time. Think of it prophetic. When six o'clock comes, sunset takes place. When sunset takes place, the gospel has been preached around the world and then the end has come. When sunset takes place, the last outpouring of the Holy Spirit has taken place. And the Bible said it's before the great and terrible day of the Lord or before the tribulation when the great outpouring happens. So here's what I'm trying to say. There's an 11th hour people, a final generation whose time is going to be short. We will not have the 50 years or the 70 years that the previous generations have had because it's five o'clock. Well, or it's the ninth hour, or it's the 11th hour. And when you have the 11th hour generation, you have a short time in which to do the work that needs to be done. But here's the good part. Not that time is shortened. Not that unless the days be short, no flesh would be saved. But here's the part that thrilled me. Because Jesus said that everybody in the 11th hour gets the same thing. That the third hour and the ninth hour and the sixth. <laughs> Folks, can I tell you something? That's why miracles are coming back. I've been preaching 42 years. I've seen, I saw God create an optic nerve in a woman whose optic nerve was lasered out because of, of surgery with a laser. I took a brain tumor and they wrecked her optic nerve. And I watched God in 30 minutes create a nerve in 1981, an optic nerve in Miss Thacker from Pulaski, Virginia, who ended up having 20-20 vision the rest of her life. I saw it with my eyes. I saw them bring a boy in 1981 to a platform that could not walk. I said, young fellow, what do you want Jesus to do? He said, I want Jesus to help me walk and play like other kids. 
And compassion went out. I said, Daddy, sit him down. I mean, the kid couldn't walk. The dad's having to carry him around. And he's, his legs are like this. And I said, in the, I prayed and said, now, in the name of Jesus, run. He shot out from his father's arms. He jumped five flights of stairs that were at the church. He ran at full speed to the back of the building, almost knocked the doors down. Came all the way back running, jumping up and down, hopping up and down. Mom is laid out in the Holy Ghost. Dad is on his knees crying. Little boy is shouting and praising God. Let me just talk to you for a minute. It's about to get wild in the real church. It's about to get real in the real church. You say, well, I don't understand all that noise. Baby, you better get used to it because we're going to start having noisy church again. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I want you to understand something. That some of you may think healing is past. And some of you go to churches that say tongues have ceased. And you've heard the cessation teaching. But you better hear me. The parable says there is an 11th hour group that's being hired in the vineyard. And he said they're going to get paid the same. The same that the ninth got. And that the sixth got. And the third got. What does that mean? We're going to have the climax of three things colliding at one time. Three things happening at one time. We're going to have outpourings of the Holy Spirit like you've never seen. We're going to see miracles restored like you've never seen. And we're going to worship God like you have never seen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now I'm gonna now I want to talk to you by the Spirit of God and tell you that have been if for you that have been in the third hour and the sixth hour and the ninth hour, you must not do what the people in the sixth hour, third hour, and ninth hour did to these eleventh hour people. They got angry because of what God did. They said, we're the ones that deserve more because we've been in the church longer than these new people. Oh, it got quiet with some of you. I've seen it. Well, how come she received the Holy Ghost? She used to be the town prostitute. She just got saved last week. And I've been in church 20 years and I've been seeking for 20 years. That's your problem. She received, you still seeking You need to quit seeking and just start receiving. You seek something that's lost. He's not lost. You don't you seek what is lost. You receive what is found. <laughs> I've seen it. Well, how come that new convert over there, he used to drink all the time. He was town drunk. He'd just been saved a month, and God just healed his liver and everything else. And I've had liver tr- trouble for 30 years. How come God hadn't healed me? Maybe it's because your attitude toward other people that's getting blessed. It's quiet. I'm just going to hit and run tonight. I'm coming for one service to hit and run, okay? I'll be out of town by morning. How come they got a home? They're new converts. They've only been married for a year and serving God a year, and I've been serving God 10 and hadn't got a house yet. How come they got a breakthrough? They, she just got a pay raise. She's not been saved but three months. And look, I've been working the same job for 10 years. They've never given me a pay raise. Hey, maybe you're working at the wrong place. Maybe you need to leave that job and find another one. You ready for me to give you something? I'm going to preach to this bunch because they're really with the rest of you. I lost you somewhere. I want to teach you a little lesson. You are no more saved than when you're saved. Lesson number two. You are no more forgiven than the moment you're forgiven. And here's the word. 
Blessings flow no matter how long you've been saved. So if Frankie Bobo comes up and gets saved tonight and really repents and his name gets in heaven, now he will grow in the grace and knowledge of God, but he can be no more saved than the moment he's saved. He's saved. Mm-hmm. Oh, 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 oh. Joel, Joel says something real interesting. He said, the former and the latter reign, and you know, if you know James chapter 5, you know Joel chapter 2, you know the scriptures in Isaiah. Rain can be either literal about the Bible saying, I'm going to send rain to the earth to bless the crops, or it can be a metaphor for the Holy Spirit's outpouring. And I was reading where Joel said, the last days I'll pour out my spirit on your sons and daughters. And he says something interesting. He said, and the early and latter rain in the first month. Now, if you know anything about early and latter rain, there's two rains in Israel. And one starts in the late fall and goes all the way to winter. And one then... You have a break, and it picks up when the winter comes in spring, and then it stops for the harvest. And you don't really get, you can't really get early and latter at one time. You have to get early or latter or latter and early. Are you tracking with me? And I, I heard the Holy Spirit say there will be a collision of glory. A collision of glory. A collision of His glory. Okay, I want to show you how this works. I'm going to talk about my ministries. I'm going to give you something personal. for I don't, And I don't really always like to do this, but sometimes the best stories you can tell are ones you've been through. <laughs> you didn't read them in a book. I want to talk to you about something that amazes me, and this goes with the 11th hour. I am, I am a fourth-generation minister. My great-grandfather was named R.L. Rexroad, and he worked for the Secret Service and quit the job and came to West Virginia, worked in the coal mines, got called to preach during the Great Depression. He preached a week when the offering was a nickel. He almost starved to death preaching in the Great Depression. It was that bad. But he kept hanging on to God. His shoes wore out, and he had to take the inner tubes of old tires and put them in the bottom of his shoes to, to keep wearing shoes. He had tires go out so many times. They used to patch him back in that day. I got his note, notes where he wrote my great-grandma and said, if God don't help me, I'm going to have to quit doing this because I don't have enough money to feed the kids. All right, think about that. Now, my grandfather, John Bava, got saved under R.L. Rex Rhodes' ministry and ended up marrying R.L. Rex Rhodes. Uh, actually, it wasn't his biological daughter, but daughter that, she, that he was raising that was his wife's brother's daughter, they were Italian and they were Le Priest, and Mr. Le Priest never met him, of course. I only hear about him. He came to the United States. Lucy, who became my grandmother, was born here and he went back to Italy and never came back for some reason. I don't know what happened. And so John Bava, who became my grandfather many years later, was a coal miner. And God baptized him in the Holy Ghost, but he had many gifts. Now track with me. Just track with me and bear with me for a moment. One of those gifts was the ability to sing. And he had the, he had the copyright at one time to over 1,000 songs. His most famous song was a song called Don't Overlook Salvation, recorded by a man named Ricky Van Shelton on his gospel album. Heaven is a city built by jewels rare. Its beauty is a splendor to behold. If you neglect salvation, you'll never enter there. You'll never, ever walk on streets of gold. Ricky Van Shelton's mom and daddy, that was their favorite song, and it took them three years to find who wrote it. That was my granddad. He got a royalty check for $25,000 on one song at age 78, and he called it hamburger money. He had one of the first recording companies, Tennessee, Ernie Ford, and Lawrence Welk, when they were nobodies, contacted him to publish in Musical Echoes magazine, which he printed in a chicken coop with his own printer. 
and then the chicken coop burned down. He had panhandle music, cozy record music since 1945, went to New York City, made big news all over West Virginia as being one of the earliest music publishing companies and record companies in the state of West Virginia. But his, his notoriety was not that. His notoriety was when he went to Gorman, Maryland in 1959, the week I was born, and had an outdoor meeting and started a church of which he built with his own hands in spare time, block by block, concrete block by block, by block and just, just when men could help him, and he built a little church in Gorman, Maryland, where I would hold my very first revival years later. Now, Granddad loved radio. He had a little, te did not national, little local television program and radio, but I used to go into his recording studio, and I'd play with his tapes, and he'd come in there and run me out because he was taping ra for, for preaching, and he was afraid I was going to erase something that he did, but I'd still sneak in. I still have cassettes, and I'm sorry, I have reel-to-reel -reel tapes to this day in a vault of me telling jokes. <laughs> Seven years old, telling jokes. He said, did you hear about the man that had this great big bag? And he came up to this house. Did you ever hear this one? And said, he tried to get in and couldn't get in. So he took a ladder from the outside and climbed up on the roof and said, then all of a sudden he broke in the house. But then before he got in the house, the bag spilled out. And you know what was in it? No, what? A bunch of baloney, just like I'm feeding you. Do y'all remember Flip Wilson? Do you remember the devil made me buy this dress? I had every, at age 11, I had every record Flip Wilson had, and I memorized it. And my daddy used to take me to member's house. And they invited us to dinner. He said, hey, Perry, come over here. Do Flip Wilson. And I would do all the, I would do all the way through the entire album and have them roaring on the floor. And when they asked me what I was going to do, I wanted to be a comedian. When I was called to preach, they thought that was a joke. <laughs> they did. So my granddad never was national was local, local radio, local print. My father came along. My father was a man that had great signs and wonders in his ministry, almost to the point that it was scary. He scared people because he was so accurate. He could be like William Branham and look at somebody and tell you everything that had happened, everything that was going to happen, predict what was going to happen. And it would, he would say, now, tomorrow at a certain time, you're going to stand at a window and a car is going to come by. And he didn't know it, but, but by the revelation of the Spirit. The last few years of his life, he had 16 people healed of cancer. Now, I don't mean they took treatments. I mean the tumors vanished and the cancer left their body by prayer. To God be the glory. But when I started preaching, my father had one problem. There's only one problem I ever saw with my dad. He had faith. For anybody, there was no disease that he'd pray for he didn't believe God could heal. I'm telling you, I've never saw nothing like it. It was incredible. And he'd pray. He prayed for a guy with throat cancer. He prayed for him. He said, go get seven, seven sips of water from the water fountain and you're healed. And the guy was healed. Went to the doctor the next day, no throat cancer. But my dad had trouble believing for finances. When I got called to preach, I had a little radio program and I had a car payment and my insurance was crazy. And I had two suits to my name and that's all I had. And he would say to me, now, son, you sure you can pay for that radio program? Well, dad, I haven't asked you for a penny, have I? Son, are you sure you can make that car payment? And the day came. Now, now stay with me for just a moment. The day came when I would build buildings that would cost millions of dollars. And my dad would walk through there and he said to me one day, the reason, look, anybody that can pray for 16 people to get healed of cancer could have a worldwide ministry. Would you agree? Yeah. I'm serious. But he said to me this, I've never seen it like this in our family before, but you have faith for this. I never had faith for it. I could have never done this because I couldn't believe for it. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I've seen you pray for people that was impossible cases. He said, but that's where my faith level was. And now we have $58 million worth of property and buildings in Cleveland, Tennessee. Reaching the world with three major worldwide ministries. You ready for me to blow your mind? And it's all paid for. We don't owe anything. Because I got the blessing of the third hour. I got the blessing of the ninth hour. I got the blessing. 
I got the blessing of the sixth tower and God said all that financial blessing that I tried to put on the other generation, I'm going to put it on a last day ministry. I hope somebody hears what I'm saying in this. I want to show you something. We'll show you two things. Oh. I'm going to show you. I want to show you the timing of God. Now, the Spirit of God has come to me to tell you this. Just now, it came to me by revelation of the Holy Ghost. Everything. In the kingdom that is ever successful, is successful not just because it was God's will and somebody obeyed. It was because the timing was perfect. Not all of the harvest fields are ripe at the same time. This, this church that's being built, for example, could not have been built in a previous time. Do you know why? The harvest wasn't ready. People's hearts weren't ready for it. God has to prepare supernaturally the hearts of people for them to do. Now, let me show you God's timing, how just absolutely remarkable it is. In 1989, uh, right around there, 88, 89, and I'd have to go back to get the exact year. Y'all, you may be able to tell me, Robbie. Father Robin Tammy's been with me for 31 years. Best friends me and Pam have, probably. Their daughter, their daughters are partners directors. So you that have know about Tiffany, that's their daughter. Huh. I had a I had a vision one night. I saw two little girls. One looked like about five, one looked like about three. The, the smaller one, I could tell by looking at the smaller one, she's holding a little stuffed animal, but she was not healthy. I could tell by the shape of her eyes, the form of her face. If I can say this, she looked a little bit like almost a Dow Syndrome child and maybe a child that had, had, had some... some well, we, I'm just going to use the old word, retardation, you know, where there was things that had not developed fully. And I asked this girl, I said, who are you? And she says, I am Amanda. And I'm the little girl you're going to have. And I said, who's this? The little one. That's Rochelle. I jumped up. I jumped out of this thing. I jumped out of this, this vision dream and grabbed my wife. And I said, you're not going to believe what I just dreamed. I just saw a little girl named Amanda who's going to be the girl we're going to have. And the, the sister was named Rochelle. And she said, well, that's an interesting name. Let's look it up. And you know what Rochelle meant? From a little stone. Well, that's my last name. From a little stone. Do you know what's strange? We could have, she got pregnant and we thought it was a girl that we painted the room pink and a boy came out. <laughs> it became a real joke in the ministry because I got up and said, we're going to have a girl. I saw a girl. I can tell you what her name is. And a boy comes out. Man walked up to me and told me, he said, you're not going to have a girl first. You'll have a girl, but you're not going to have I said, why? He said, because the Bible said, holy is the male child that opens up the womb. He said, a prophet has to have a boy. I said, okay, whatever. That's what I said, whatever. And a boy pops out. I didn't even have, I didn't even have a name for him. And God, God showed me by revelation what to name him. Now listen. Whew. 11 years almost goes by, and we don't have this baby girl. And my wife's almost 40. She's 39. And I say to my wife, I had something weird happen. She said, what was that? I said, I was just, she, in fact, she walked in when it happened. I was laying down from a trip and I was laying on the bed and I had a baby's hand grab my ankle right there, my ankle, and hold on like it was balancing itself. And I felt that hand and there was no baby there. I said, oh my God, Pam. And she said, what's, what's wrong with you? I'm sitting up and I'm shaking my head. I said, a baby. A ba I said, we're supposed to try to have a baby. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to me and said, that's right. And faith without works is dead. <laughs> I heard it. I really did. I'm sitting up. He said, faith without works is dead. 
And I told Pam, I said, Pam, the Lord just spoke to me. The faith without works is dead. She laughed and she says, now, you know, I'm 30, I'm, you know, I'm 39. I said, well, Sarah was 890. She got pregnant. And the strangest thing happened about seven uh, weeks, wasn't it? We're at a camp meeting and she miscarried the baby. So she said to me afterwards, she says, don't look like that baby's going to get here. I said, that baby's going to get here, Pam. I said, I saw a baby girl and she gave me her name. And I said, we may have lost one of them, but there's one of them that's still coming. So I went to Israel. I'm not going to go into that story, but I had some Arab friends say, if you'll eat this, your wife will have a baby. I don't think that's what did it, but... But my office manager and I both ate something over there that's really weird, and I'm not going to tell you in the pulpit what it was, and we both, his wife and my wife got pregnant. I'll tell you later, but I ain't going to tell the church. Gross you out. On the seventh month of the pregnancy, the doctor said she had to go, she was 40, and she had to go to a specialist, you know, because of her age. He said, Miss Stone, your, the water, I call it the water, is leaking from you. And your baby, if this keeps up, is going to be born totally mentally retarded. I want you to go to bed, and I want you to get out of bed. The only way I want you to get up is to go to the restroom. But they must feed you in bed. They must give you water in bed. They must, you must not move. Because if you, if you do move, and all of this, what do you call that water? Fluid. I couldn't hear a thing you said. Ambionic. I always want to say umbilical fluid. That's not it. Ambionic fluid. It's leaking. It's leaking. And he said that this is very serious. And she went to bed and I told her, I did not see a child that was deformed. The one who told me her name was sassy, cute, and healthy. And that baby's going to be healthy. You watch. We went to the hospital on August the 2nd. Now watch me. I'm giving, I'm making a point. 12 years later, 12 years later. And that little girl was born, and we named her Amanda. She's 17 years of age, and she's called into ministry, and she's getting ready to go to the Ramp School of Ministry, which is a great school, Karen Wheaton School. Holy Ghost, brother. Ain't no crazy stuff down there, baby. It's Holy Ghost. You better be. they kick you out if you ain't in the Holy Ghost. No, she's a great lady. She's a dear friend. But watch this. I said to myself, Lord, why did, why, why did, why 12 years? We never really felt led. I was traveling. Why wait? And then one day I watched <laughs> this big building that we built in Cleveland, Tennessee, which is, we had a warrior fest. We've got one coming up in a few weeks and we have about 5,000, four or 5,000 kids that show up, all young people. Pack that place. That's wild. And I watched my baby girl at 16 grab a microphone and give a testimony of something she went through that me and her mama didn't even know. And I saw a preach come on her. And the Lord spoke to me and said, she could have come earlier, but she would have been in her late 20s and she would not have been able to minister to this generation. I went, oh my goodness. And I believe I'm, I'm going to stand here and speak it because sometimes you get what you speak and sometimes you just speak. <laughs> I'm believing that she's going to marry a Holy Ghost filled preacher that's wilder than me. I want one wilder than me. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm, 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 I'm going to put my faith out and they're going to come and be my youth leaders. That's what I'm believing for. Now, if that's not the will of God, Lord, you do what you want. God's look, how many know God's going to do what he wants anyway? <laughs> Come on, dreaming's free. Touch your neighbor say, dreaming's free. I'll dream free. I want you to know something, and that is this. That what you do must be timed perfect. And when you find the mind of God and you hit the timing of God, now, don't miss what I'm about to say. It will accelerate on you incredibly. Y'all got time for this? 
I'm at the end of the message. I'm just, I'm just sharing now for just a moment. I remember when the Lord told me to father a generation when my boy was a drug addict dying in a hospital. I'm talking dying. His heartbeat was 200 and some beats a minute. And his heart could have exploded because the doctor stood there and told me he could die on me. And I had to intercede for four straight hours praying in the Holy Ghost for my boy not to die. And thank God, God spared him. But twice he could have died on me. Timing of God. So God tells me to father a generation. And I did some things just for the sake of making the devil mad. But God spoke to me to father a generation. And, I, and I, he said, if you will reach other people's children, I'll take care of yours. I went to build a building in which three banks in town, my three banks, would not loan me a penny. My three banks. The banks that I could walk into, and one bank I'd given them $15 million, another $30 million, another one about 25 over the past 40 years. And they're looking at me telling me, well, it's for kids. And kids can't pay the bills. And so we can't give you anything because we don't want you to build an $18 million building and get stuck with the bill. And it made me so mad, I looked at my wife and said, God built me two buildings without a bank. Not near as expensive. So we'll build this one without it. And I didn't say it in meanness. I said it because it was in my spirit. It's a difference. I wasn't saying it trying to make something happen. It was in, I said, I feel it. She said, where's the money going to come from? I said, a millionaire. She said, we don't know any. I said, God does. Seriously. So I got my young people praying. I said, you're going to pray and you're going to ask God. I'm going to tell you how to pray, Pastor. God, I felt the Holy Ghost right there. Okay, I'm going to tell you how to pray. When you need excessive money, you need to find somebody who has a lot of money. So I didn't know one. So I had my kids pray, God, awaken the spirit of a millionaire. We don't care. And then they started praying this. God, he has our money. He has our money. And you need to show him it belongs to us, not to him. And then I, then I had a woman come in a prayer room. Now, I want you to listen to me. And she got every scripture on finances she could find and prayed it eight hours a day. I need it. You listen to me. I needed $14 million and I wasn't going to get it from a bank because no bank would give it to me. And she got to praying and she said, God, you know, it's not for the, it's for the kingdom. Now, where's he at God? Where's he at God? Where's he at God? And then one day my bookkeeper walked in with a, with a, over, y'all got time for this with a package from Fidelity Investments. And she said, you will not believe what just came in. I said, what's it for? She says, it's not designated. It's used for whatever, but it's an anonymous donor. And I said, what is it? She says, it's a million dollars. We had never got that. I'd been preaching years and years. Never got anything close to that. We're hooping. We're hollering. We're running around. We're shouting. I showed it to the, the little church we were in at that time. The little church didn't hold 150 people, and it was mostly a bunch of young people. And I showed it to them, and they flipped on the floor, rolled on the floor like a bunch of holy rollers, knocked chairs over. I even saw a baby flying. It must have been a doll baby. It wasn't a real one. <laughs> now, when that happened, my kids who were prayer warriors said, if God can give us one, he can give us more. How much you need? I said, do you really want to know? I need $3 million. Because they're buying steel now. They're buying the big stuff now. It was millions. It wasn't hundreds of thousands. So they said, they went to the barn. They held it by three, 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 three. It was, it was, it got funny. We were praying crazy prayers. You know? It's coming. It's coming. Awaken them. Awaken them. And God bear me record in heaven. My wife called me one day and said, are you sitting down or standing up? And I said, well, I'm standing. She says, you might want to sit. She's crying. I'm thinking, oh, God, something bad's happening. You know, you just think she's crying. Pam, don't cry. She said, 
have you talked to the bookkeeper? And I said, no, why? She said, you don't know what just happened. I said, no, what? She said, that same group, whatever that group is, just sent you a check for, for the VOE building fund for $3 million. Well, let, let me let me just shorten this for let me just shorten this for you and said I do not well we think we're ninety nine percent we know I'll never tell the person's name they're not even saved wow. they're a businessman they're they're a billionaire businessman but they're not even Christian you all didn't hear what I said but they like my preaching one family gave us fourteen million dollars we paid our building off. Before we ever moved in it, somebody needs to pray that God will awaken the spirit of a millionaire. No, it can happen. You're looking at a you're looking at a guy that can tell you it can happen. Now here's, the, now, here's my point. Why did God do that? Here's why. Because he told me to father a generation to build a gathering place for a generation. So if it's God's will, it's God's bill. Yeah. Did he? No, seriously. No, seriously. When he has told you to do it, you have to do what he tells you and not try to figure out how we're going to do this. I moved in a little hall right next door to this big hall with only 150 to 200 people. And now on a Tuesday night in a county that has 380 churches in my county. Cleveland, Tennessee is the Bible buckle of the East Coast of the United States. There's more churches in Bradley County than almost any county in America. And we have a Tuesday night service. And we have 650 probably to 700 people that show up on a Tuesday night. Tuesday. Are you kidding me? And 50 to sometimes 200 to 250 to show up at a Thursday night live prayer meeting. And I say this for the glory of God and Father, this is for all for your glory. And we never have to worry about finances. Because every time. Can I build your faith? Look, look, I'm not, look, I'm not, I'm not bragging on me. And I told your pastor, I didn't even come for an offering. I said, if you want to give one to our ministry, you're going to be blessed. But you don't have to give nothing. Because you know what? God takes care of me. No, seriously. I'm not, I'm not trying to be, I'm not arrogant. I'm very humble about this. But I'm going to show. See, I think the Lord sent me here because you're building a beautiful building. And the, con the congregation needs to have faith to believe God's in it. And God will increase you with blessings with people. And there's a reason... Ah, uh, that you don't even know. You, there's a reason you don't even know yet. Because he, he's not going to show you everything yet. Okay. okay. Karen Wheaton was ministering at my building at the ramp, which is called Winter Ramp. And she never told me a thing. She was receiving the offering with a bunch of kids. Look, kids can't give. They just got a dollar, you know. I call that the Church of God offering. They're all going to give a dollar. You know? <laughs> it's a joke. Don't get upset. So, um, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's a joke. It really is. So she's up there, and the Lord, the Lord speaks to me and tells me that she needs this huge amount of money. And I'm over here pacing back and forth. And Pam looked at me. Now, my wife is very sensitive. She says, okay, God's telling you to do something, isn't he? I said, yeah, and it's crazy. She says, I already know. <laughs> I said, okay, that's, that's too. And I think, I, did I go over to you? Where was I? I went over to somebody else. And they looked at me and they said, I see it on you. I see it on you. You're about to get up. And I'm, I'm about to get up. And I'm going to tell you what, and it's not that we had it because we're trying to build a camp ourselves. So we need everything we can get. And God spoke to me and said, I want you to give Karen Wheaton's ministry 
I did not know till after service when she sat in my room and cried, she says, I was about to go home and shut down the ramp school of ministry. We have not paid our staff in six weeks. I've had to lay off a certain percentage of my people. She said, it blew my mind when God told you because you knew nothing. And I told Rick, Rick's on my board. You say nothing to Perry. I don't want them, anybody to know. I want to see what God will do. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask anybody for anything. And I, I got up and told my people and I said, everybody pay attention. It was on Tuesday night. I said, you know what we gave Karen? And I, I went to a CD and pulled it out. It's called an emergency CD. Well, I felt that was an emergency for her. And I pulled it out and gave it to her. And I said, but I want you to listen to me. In 90 days, that amount will come back to us. And we had nothing that would show that's going to happen. Nothing. Whew. Hallelujah. Now, let me, show you how, let me show you how God does. Brother, I'm here for you tonight. Y'all just bear with us. I'm, I'm as serious as I can be. The Holy Spirit, I had no idea this was going to go this way. I had a whole different plan. God wants me to build faith in this congregation. And that's what I'm here for. Y'all, are y'all going to receive this? Are you going to receive this? I'm, I'm here to build your faith. In less than 90 days, I told him in 90 days it's coming back. And it's, it's the weirdest thing because I love walking with God. But this couple will tell you everything I speak I get. And it scares me. And I'm going to tell you why it scares me. Because I never want to abuse that. I never want to ask stuff for me or be selfish. Because I'm not going to abuse a gift. I ain't going to be Balaam. But he'll tell you, if I say, I'd like a certain vehicle. I say nothing and I get the color and the vehicle. Out, without even trying. It's, it's the most, I'm just telling you, it's ridiculous. Now, so I said 90 days. I felt it. In my, I, I'm, saying, I'm saying what I feel in my spirit, see. I'm not just blabbing. As I'm under the anointing, I say what I feel in the spirit. This is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Ready? We get a letter from an attorney. And my bookkeeper says, this is something really strange. A woman by this name, has left a voice of evangelism in her will. I said, praise God, that is wonderful. And how much is it? She says, well, you know, I can't read this, all this stuff. It's about $20,000, I think. I said, oh, wow, that's great. You know, I'm thinking about we could use it for this, so we could put it on TV. I'm just, I'm going through this. Then she, then a month goes by, and she says, you got to come over here and see this, because you're not going to believe this. Now, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Many years ago, Many years ago, I went to a funeral of a woman that was the mother of some of my top partners. And we flew in and flew out. And I walked up to an older woman and introduced myself. They said, well, this is Miss So-and-so. And I said, well, so good to meet you. She says, yes, I'm very good friends with this family. This older woman, right? Only time I ever met her. Only time I ever shook her hands, ever. Her husband died, and he invented the Apollo ship. He was at NASA and helped invent it, okay? I didn't know this. She tells my partner, all this comes out just recently. She tells my partner, I have no family. I have no heirs. I want you to take my estate, and I want you to tell me where to put the money. And she was going to give St. Jude's Hospital $3 million. And he said, you know, that's great, but they have support. You know, they get a lot of, and they do. St. Jude's is very blessed on, on these guys. And uh, he said, why don't you just spread that out. She said, well, who? And he said, why don't you just leave something for Voice of Angels? She said, I like him. I watch him on TV all the time. I think I will. Now listen, totally unexpected. Met her one time. I'm telling you what God does. I'm telling you what God does. And when the check came in, I called. First thing I did was pick up the phone and called Karen. And the second thing I did on Tuesday night was tell our church, it is 68 days into the 90 days. And I'd like to show you a check for $405,000. God has to learn 
that he can trust you with little things. Little obe- just little obedience. Go give that guy a cup of water over there. That guy's thirsty. Let me go. What do you like to drink, brother? Coke? Okay, let me get you one. Little stuff. And then when he sees that you're willing to do little things and not complain about it, you know what will happen? You get a little bigger assignment. And then you get a little bit bigger blessing. But it's taking the steps of faith. Now, I'm going to end with this, I I guess. Of course, Paul said, Paul said, finally, my brethren wrote three more chapters. (laughs) I I have to leave the name of this minister off because he... There's a, there's a section of this I cannot publicly tell you because he said, Perry, please publicly don't tell this part. Don't, don't say this name because there's a sign. Him and I know what it will be. There's a sign that will happen, and this is God's sign that he's about to do this. A very dear friend of mine, and hon, if you'll put that phone up because I don't, thank you, I don't want this on, on anything like that. This is just really too private. Thank you, dear. Are you? Should we cut it off? Can you pause streaming? Pause streaming for a minute because, yeah, yeah. Yeah, bring, bring live stream back because let's get this in. Let's get this in. Hope we can get it, get it in. Three things I want you to hear. And, and for you that go to church here, this is especially for you, for you that are visiting, receive this. Thing number one is, and I'm going to talk to pastor here, he is doing the will of God. Amen. He's doing the will of God. Amen. This is going to be, I, I, look, look. I've been to church. I've been to thousands of them. This may end up being the most beautiful church that I've ever walked in in 42 years. And I'm not talking about just the, just the, the beauty of the people make it beautiful too. You understand? You're doing the will of God. So the enemy, when he comes and there's anything that happens, like, Man, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? You just press. And you just keep preaching and you keep reaching people. Why am I saying this? I'm getting, I'm getting something here. I'm, I, I'm supposed to tell you this story. I'm supposed to tell you this. I will forget it later. I have a dear friend of mine that has big vision. One to buy a school, one to buy this, one to buy that. Didn't have the money. And one boy got saved. One kid who was on drugs. One kid. And he fell in love with that kid, and that kid fell in love with that pastor, and he just put him on staff and knew nothing about his family. And his dad showed up from Texas, who invented the drills that go that way for fracking. And said to this pastor, said to this pastor, my boy's salvation and my boy's deliverance means more than all the money I have. And he said, tell me what you need. He said, man, I'm not going to do that. And he said, well, I'll just write out a check, hand him a check for $5 million, which enabled him to buy what he wanted to buy. I don't know why I'm supposed to tell this man of God this, but when you know you're doing the will of God, as big as it is, because when I built that building, I'm looking at 3,500 seat auditorium and I'm saying, God, how am I going to fill this? And they told me, they said, your first warrior fest, you're going to be lucky to have 500 kids because everybody sees you as the prophecy preacher, the Hebraic roots guy. These kids don't know you as that. And I said, well, bless God, I'll have 500. We'll just build it from there. You know how many kids showed up for the first one? 4,000. <laughs> 4,000. You're doing, when you know you're doing the will of God, Oh, really? Okay. (laughs) Now, there will be a few, and I'm hearing a few, distractors that are like sand ballot. And they'll try to pull you off the wall with just just distractions. And you'll say and you'll say to yourself, Well, this is this is just a crazy distraction. Because what a distraction is is to pull you off the focus of the assignment. 
So there'll be, it's not, I don't see many. I just, just a few distractors and I'm not sure what it is. But ne, do like Nehemiah and say, I got, a, I got a sword in one hand. I got a plow in the other. And I'm not coming down to the plane of oh no to have a conversation with you. Okay. See, you, you, do, you do realize in the Bible that says, it said they tried to get him to the plains of oh no. You know what the plains of Ona are, don't you? You get down there and say, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. What did I do this for? Oh, no, okay. Okay. Will of God, the distractors. And then I, I feel by the Spirit to tell you to do what we did. Find you an old saint in this church who loves, I mean, just rather pray than do anything. Get a couple ladies. You got three grannies here, don't you? Three grannies. Retired grannies. Now, you have them find scriptures on God's financial plans. God, just anything, anything that says, I'll prosper you and I'll bless you. And you get them in a room and give them appointments and say, right there's a hundred scriptures. We, and have them walk, speak blessing, just get them somewhere and keep them praying. And then I want you to, I, and I don't tell many people this because I believe everybody has different words. P- pray for God to awaken the spirit of people. It might be people that are in Hawaii. Oh. It might be people that's all the way over there where you've come from. But it could be people in places you've ministered. It could be people that are here. But God will raise up somebody that will say, I am the person that God wants me to hook up with you to build something that's going to affect a generation. And then the fourth thing is never compromise what you know is true. When you grow, and you'll grow, the tendency will be, and it's just a tendency, well, if we change this a little bit, ah, maybe, maybe we need to do, oh, golly. May, well, maybe if we did that, and there'll even be pressure sometimes from people. Well, Pastor, I believe if we did it this way, we might reach a whole, listen, I know what got me to the dance. Okay. And, I, and after 42 years, I'm still as wild and crazy and tongue-talking the Holy Ghost fire and praying for people as I was then. And I know I'm not called to reach everybody. I'm only called to reach a segment of people whose hearts are turned to God for the Word. All right. Robbie, come here. Tammy, would you come over here? And, put, and Sherry, I want you to put your hands on sister right here. I want everybody, if you will... To put your, stretch your hands this way, just kind of hold them up. And I want you, this is what I want you to do. I want you to come into agreement with me in prayer. Now, huh, Father, I ask you to put a hedge around the, both the couple and individually him, a barrier and a hedge. And hedge him in that no arrow, no dagger, no sword, no words, and no crazy people will be able to penetrate the protection around them to create uh, frustration or aggravation or discord or weakness or whatever it might be. Lord, I sense a heart to really reach people and see people touched. Endos merepito da slada und uspai to katalisto to kachai to prus frundele sete. Oh God, do something in this town and within a 90 mile radius that is so powerful and exciting that people cannot resist coming into the house of God they cannot resist hearing the word of the Lord they cannot resist 
the power and the wisdom of God. Oh, God, I thank you for this, man. I thank you that the Holy Ghost put me on an assignment to come here on this Friday night. You have us do different things at different times, God, but this is something very special, and I feel it in my spirit. And I'm asking you because I do know in the spirit that it does take much finance to complete great assignments and great walls and great facilities for the kingdom. So I'm asking you to supernaturally bless the people. Let them find gold mines in their yard. Let them find what oil, let them find gas. Let them find all the stuff that they need in their own yard. Their property. Sales. Things will sell that haven't sold before. Oh, that's for somebody here. Property that's been trying to sell for a long time. And you've already told God. Somebody here's told God, God, if you'll help me sell this, I'm going to bless the church where the Lord says it's done. For somebody that's been wanting to do it, it's, you're, going to get, you're going to get a phone call in the next 30 days. Or, Ooh, hallelujah. Because God says, I'm ready to bless the people who are ready to be a blessing. I'm ready to bless the people who are ready to be a blessing. I want everybody in this building that's saved, raise your hand. Everybody that knows Christ as Savior, raise your hand. And the precious folks in the overflow room, I hope that they're, they know that we're, we're thinking about them as well. Thank you for being here and sitting there. Now, I want you to put your hands down. I'm going to tell you what I feel in my spirit right now. I feel that God wants to refresh in people with the Holy Spirit, and He wants to restore the joy of the Lord in some people. Some of you have gone through a long time this past year, even this year, and you don't feel the excitement or the joy of the Lord that you one time felt. I'm telling you, the Spirit of oh, glory, the Spirit of God is here right now to do something for everybody who will release your faith. So if you need God to give you a refreshing, and I, you're, you're saying, God, I, you know I need this, I need this tonight, I've come for something, and you need this, and in that refreshing, you need the joy of the Lord I mean, on a different level than you've had. Stand to your feet right now. Hallelujah. 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 Yes. See, the Lord knows. The Lord knows. The Lord knows. The Lord knows. Now, you hear me. I believe that the power of God, when a man speaks under the, under the anointing, that the power of God comes through the atmosphere because the, the, the Spirit of God is called the Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew, and it's the wind of God, the breath of God, the life of God. And as the Spirit of God begins to move, I want you to forget who's on your left and who's on your right. I want you to totally forget about who that person is. And I want you, when I ask you to, to lift your voice like thunder and begin to pray, and I'm going to pray from here, and I'm going to start sending through faith the, the presence of the Lord to come to you and start filling you and refilling you with the Holy Spirit. If it's been a long time since you prayed in the Holy Ghost, you're about to pray in the Holy Ghost. Eta. Some of you are going to get a brand new tongue. God's going to give you a new tongue as a sign of refreshing. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's lift up our hands and let's lift up our voice. In the name of the Lord. God, right now, by the power of the Holy, Holy Ghost, by the anointing of the Holy Ye. I call on the name of the Lord God. I call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ right now, the Son of the living God. God, in this church in Wasilla, I'm asking you, Lord, to pour out your Spirit, O oh God. Pour out your Spirit, Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus. Let the anointing come. Let the anointing come. Fill them up. Refill them. Refill them. Refill them. Refill them. Joy. 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 You did a little Come on. It's happening already. It's already happening. Let the life of God be released right now. Let the Spirit of God be released right now. Let the power of God be released right now. Stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. Come on, somebody in the back is getting, getting filled with the Holy Ghost right now. Now, 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 now. Receive. 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 Sheila Babari. Come on, for five minutes, come on, press in, press in, press in. Father God, we believe you, God, we believe you. To restore and reap for the joy of the Lord and the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. 
in the name of Jesus to restore to Tita da Barata to restore the joy of the Lord in Jesus name Salabore be baronda le boro katara kasata shela baba reta tara baba reta take a sota kara sela manda de da de da bore be baba mamanda le bashanta mora biba kiseleta tera kosita ida baresha karianda le bosota in the name 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 Ramama matata Norabasha kata kasati harabasa Shikara basha karisa Se poni andale moko shakari babasa Ida bashi koto tarika sata tata Yo Mama 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 madade le boro boko shatari kasata tata kasota taraba God, work it out, 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 work it out. Do the impossible, do the impossible. Work it out in the name of Jesus, work it out in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, do the impossible, do the impossible. God, put the blessing of God, we speak the, the blessing of God. The great blessing of God, a great financial blessing of God, great financial blessing of God, Heavenly Father, upon this congregation, upon these people, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus, by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the power of your Spirit, Lord, as a testimony of God, as a testimony of the power of God, as a testimony of God's anointing. Also on Sherry, Lord. For her heart is a servant of God and a heart to serve other people. Hallelujah. Do you work, O Lord? Do the impossible, God. Do what is impossible, God, for the people. Restore right now the joy of the Lord. Heavenly Father, reach down and restore the joy of the Lord into the spirit, right now into the heart. Loose the people in Jesus' name to receive the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. Oh, some, God is doing something for you in your spirit. He's doing something for you deep. Just receive from Him right now. His, the atmosphere is charged with the anointing of God for you to receive from Him. Hallelujah. 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 Do it, Lord. 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 Monday, Moshe, 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 Mokati, Moshe, Mahani, Mahani, Hashata, Mote, Moshe, 
Abede, Mose, Kamba, Mekoto, Alemia, Amashiana, Nodo, Noshe, Mate, Ledo, Nosele, Neda Bosonte, Hilali, Isha, Hallelujah, Isha, 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 Otani, Osha, Mo, Ye, Yana, Ha, Oh, stir up the water of God, stir up the water of God. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yena moria, yena morias, poriasiata. Yeko moria menesh, le madon de le manda. Pisoneka tira do bresa la crosseka. Joy, 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 joy of the Lord. Joy, 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 joy. Joy, joy, joy. Joy, 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 joy of the Lord, joy, 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 joy. Me, 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 Hallelujah. Bless his name. God's presence is very strong right now. God's presence is very strong. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Lord. My Lord and my God, we give you glory for all that you have done, Lord. Through the ministry that you've given us, we give you glory for all that's happened in this church and the other churches here in Alaska, God. But we believe that there's seasons, there's awakenings and revivals. Put it in the heart of the people. Put it in the heart of your people. Put it in the heart of those who are hungry and they don't know what they're hungry for. Put it in their spirit. Put it in their hearts to receive from you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. How many of you, how many of you heard the Spirit of God pray through you? Would you raise your hand? Did you hear the Holy Spirit pray through you? Hold your hand up. You heard that. You heard in other tongues, in other language, you heard the Holy Spirit pray through you. How many of you f- felt as you were praying? Because there was an atmosphere that it, there was something that happened. I could sense it here. But how many of you sensed something break in you? And you felt a new touch of a joy come up. You felt something bubbling. How many of you got a little bubbly tonight? You get a little, all right, all right, all right. And I'm trying to wave things by the Lord, and I feel like He's telling me I'm done. Now, look, I could preach another three hours, but I am not going to do that because I don't feel the anointing right now to do that. But I want a Pastor to come, and he may have a word, he might want to say something. But uh, just be seated, if you will, please, and let him come and just share. Uh, dismiss whatever he wants to do. And I, 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 want, I want to say this to you. I have got to slip out and change. It's cold up here. Now you, y'all think you're having a heat wave. It's cold up here. And I'm wet. And if I hang around in the cool, I'll lose my voice. I have to go change. So please, I'm not getting away from you. Trust me. And I'll, I'll see what happens after that. But I've got to get out of this wet shirt. Is that okay? <laughs> Why don't you put your hands together for Dr. Perry Stone? Come on. Come on, stand up. You can do a little bit better than that. God, thank you so much. Hey! Come on. Hey! You may be seated. We're going to go ahead and receive a love offering for our guest, as is our custom here. We're going to bless him. He didn't ask me to do that. It's the right thing. You give honor where honor is due. 
Ushers are coming up and down the aisles to assist you if you'd like IRS tax credit. You need to get an envelope and fill that out. There's four different ways that you can give. Those of you online, you can give through the website, kcalaska.com. Many have downloaded our app. Our app is great. It's got a lot of wonderful resources. You can watch our services on the, our app. Download that at Google Play or at the uh, App Store. Just look for King's Chapel, Alaska. It'll lead you. Follow those intuitive links. You can download that. You can give through the app. You can text to give. You text KC Wasilla to 77977. And the entirety of this offering goes to Dr. Perry Stone, Voice of Evangelism Ministry. And what a what an honor. What a word tonight. My goodness. My goodness. Amazing. I'm humbled. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Sherry, for opening the door. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something I learned a long time ago. I learned to name my seed. This is not your tithe. You don't, you don't tithe to a guest ministry. You tithe to your church, right? So if you're visiting us here, you know, you don't you don't tithe here, you tithe back. This is a great place to say amen right there. All right. So you're sowing, you're, you're giving. See, supply seed for the sower. So we're gonna sow. Name your seed. What are you believing for? What are you believing? You're, you're sowing seed into his ministry. We'll send one check on to him for the entirety of what comes in. What are you sowing for? What are you believing for? You can write that on the back of your envelope or you could just get it in your heart. You pray and believe. Amen. All right, ushers, would you come? Actually, you know what we'll do? We'll do the old symmetrical bucket thing. Key word is symmetrical. If you could put the buckets in an equidistant pattern. Now, my wife and I, we give electronically, so we kind of went through withdrawals until we figured it out. So we, uh, we give electronically, and when we do, we just come up and we tap that bucket because we don't drop envelopes anymore. We give electronically in the secure methods that we have. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come on, hold. Stand up on your feet. Hold that. Hold that up to the Lord. Let's thank God for Voice of Evangelism, Perry Stone. He's a man of integrity. There's no guile. Like, the way he is, he is the way he is. I've just really enjoyed spending time with him. I, I really have. There's no flash. It's, he is filled with the Spirit, filled with revelation, and he's been running the race for 40-something years. It's good soil you're going to sow into. So thankful for him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. The voice of evangelism, Dr. Perry Stone and his beautiful family. We bless them now and pray as we sow seed into the ministry that it would flourish. That the broadcast and the TV would go around the world even more. The greater impact in these days as he turns to 60 years old. That you would give him greater fruitfulness than he has ever known in this next year. That this next year, the remaining months that are left in this year on into 2020, would be the greatest years of ministry and harvest he has ever known. Now bless the gift and the giver even a hundredfold in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on out and sow, sow your seed into his ministry. And if you can return to your seat, we're just about done.
on your feet, put your hands here like this. Jesus. the web stream on YouTube on Facebook as you begin to examine your heart tonight if you are not right with God come on all the way in our overflow room take a look if you died tonight would this be your, your if this could be your last night would you don't go to heaven would you would you go have you been washed in the blood? Have you been born again? If you've not been born again, do not leave this place. Don't turn off the broadcast without getting right with God. Because there is a hell that's to shun and a heaven that's to gain. It's been purchased for you by the blood of Jesus. If you believe in your heart and you confess in your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be. There's no other name given among men by which you must be saved. You must repent, ask for forgiveness for all the lying, cheating, stealing, taking the Lord's name in vain, for breaking God's law. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but the gift, the Bible says, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You can't make it to heaven by going to church or going to a Dr. Perry Stone meeting any more than you can become an automobile by standing in a garage. You must be born again. Every service we ever have, we close this way. D.L. Moody, the night, the great night of the Chicago fire, didn't give an altar call and did not know how it went for many of his members that died in that fire. He made a vow before the Lord and said, I will never close another service. We follow suit. 
because you don't know when you're going to breathe your last. Man is given but one life to live, and after that, the judgment. Bow your head, close your eyes, those of you online. Examine your heart. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, won't you do it now? Or maybe you have and you drifted in your walk and you want to recommit to the Lord. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and be courageous. And give your life back to God or give your heart to Him for the first time. Or thirdly, maybe, maybe you're just not sure if you're saved. You're not sure if your sin's forgiven. Again, you want to give your heart to Jesus for the first time. You've never done that before. In a moment, I want to ask you to lift your hand. Number two, you gave your heart to Jesus, but you know you're in compromise. You know that you're not right with God. You're not as on fire as you used to be. And you want to come home tonight to the Lord. Or thirdly, the enemy lies to you and you're just not sure really if you're saved and you want to be sure. If you fit in any of those three categories on the count of three, all across this place, those online, in the overflow, on the count of three, you say, that's me, Pastor. On the count of three, you raise your hand. One, two, three. Do it right now. God bless you. Raise it high, unashamed. God bless you. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Praise the Lord. Thank you. God bless you. I see that hand. Come on, just make eye contact with me. God bless you. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless you, sweetheart. God bless you. Lift your hand high on this side. God bless you. All the way in the back, I see your hand, young man. God bless you. Raise your hand high. You want to be included in this prayer. God bless you. God bless you. Up in the, up in the overflow room. God bless you, pastors. Acknowledge and minister to them. If you raised your hand, we're going to sing this one more time. Service will be over. Come on, it's Friday night. There's nothing on Netflix. You can eat in a minute. If you raise your hand and you're serious, you meant business with God, or maybe you didn't, but you know you need to be up here, I'm going to invite you as soon as we sing that again. As soon as we sing that again, get out from where you are. Come to the front. You're going to pray and receive Jesus. Repent of your sin. Make heaven your home. And we'll dismiss just after. You ready? Set. Go. Come on. Meet me right here. Come on. Come from all over the place. Right front and center. See how close you can get to my hand. Come on, come. Come on, come. You want to put your hands together for these. Come on. Come on. Come all the way up. Come on, there's room for you. Come on, come. My future and my hope. Your promises never fail. If you're coming from the overflow room, gather your stuff and come. We'll wait for you. Come on. Your promises never fail. Come on, put those hands together. Come on, like this. It's okay to get happy in church. You ready? Come on, we're waiting for you to come from the overflow. And if you need to be up here, get on down here. Just a couple more minutes. The service is over. Go on, sing it. I am standing on every promise that you made. I will see it come to pass in your name. Come on. In your come on. Name. Say, do I have to do it out loud? Yes. Yes, it's important to do out loud. You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth unto salvation. Very important to do it out loud. Are you ready? I said, are you ready up front? And in this moment, when you pray this very simple prayer, believing on Jesus that he died on a cross and rose again from the grave for you, everything you've ever done wrong, all of your sin will be washed away thrown as the Bible says as far as the east is from the west and you will be what is called a new creation born again it's good news
pray with us all together up front, right out loud. Those of you in the congregation, affirm your faith. Those online, and if we have people in the overflow that hasn't made it down, you just pray right where you're at. Say with me, repeat after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, to die in our place. Forgive me for all of my sin. And just as Jesus rose again from the grave, raise my life up. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Lift your hands to heaven all across this place. It's a universal sign of surrender. Come on, you're just surrendering to him. Let me pray. Holy Spirit, I pray. Break every chain. Break every curse. Release your power. Fill these with your Holy Spirit right now. Now, if you have the freedom to pray in the Spirit, go ahead, congregation, pray. Those of you that have come up front, let those sounds and syllables just come forth. The Holy Spirit praying through you. Be filled. Be healed. thank you put your best hand clap together for God those of you that are up front I have a team of people that are going to minister to you right now so go ahead team let me close in blessing you wasn't it a powerful night wasn't it powerful he said I got to come back I said for sure please come back come back come back when he comes back I believe we'll be in our new building how many of you believe for that Lord awaken people Awaken people to the, what you're doing in Alaska. Draw them in. God, I thank you for these that you've gathered, that your word that's run forth with power and authority. Now bless your people. Cause your face to shine upon us. Lift up your countenance towards us. Be gracious to us, God. And give us peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Remember, God's on the throne and the devil's been defeated. Hey, if you don't have a home church, this is a great one. Come and join us. A lot of great things going on. We'll hope to see you. God bless you.